Well, good evening and welcome everyone to night one of Plenary Tracker, bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. My name is Genevieve Jacobs. I'll be chairing these sessions for the next week. Along with many of you, I'm on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, their traditional ownership of this place and commit myself to ongoing acts of reconciliation. And I also acknowledge the elders of the places from whence you join us. We'll speak together each night from 7.30 with the intention of sharing information, ideas, critiques and advocacy stemming from this great gathering, a momentous event for the Australian, Australasian Catholic Church at every level, from the hierarchy to the pews, the schools, social work, social justice, everywhere the people of the church find themselves in God's work. This particular event, the Plenary Tracker, has been brought together by many who are part of an active reform movement. And its intention is to ensure open communications about what goes on in the council and by doing so to stir discussion, debate and wholehearted engagement. We've got a range of guests, passionate advocates, including delegates to the council and space for your questions each night with a moderator. So please do post those in the chat function on your screens. And please let's have respectful engagement, questions that truly take us somewhere useful. James is our technical administrator. Please message him through the Q&A if you're experiencing any difficulties. We'll begin tonight by looking at expectations for the Plenary Council with guests John Warhurst and panel members Terry Futrell and Eleanor Flynn as we consider what the Catholic community's aspirations are and what to expect. But first, what happened today? Well, here is the news. The Archbishop of Perth, Tim Costello, launched the plenary with a professionally televised solemn mass that included not only the smoke of incense, but also that of a smoking ceremony accompanied by didgeridoo music. Today's liturgy maximised the Vatican II reforms. While women participated, however, they were excluded from the altar, which of course was left to, to men except, uh, and those celibate, except for the deacon, perhaps who is after the council allowed to be married. Archbishop Costello drew heavily on the key Vatican II document on the constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, which tells us that we are in principle, a kind of sacrament that is a sign and instrument of communion with God and unity among all people. So the signs and the symbols paid heed to a distinctively Australian church and a distinctly Vatican II grounding. But if the global church's last great reform moment was now 60 years ago, what comes next? and with our church here in the great southern land of the Holy Spirit. I'm joined first by John Warhurst, Chair of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn, a Plenary Council member and Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the Australian National University. John, good evening to you. Undoubtedly an historic occasion, but I think fair to say there's also some trepidation associated with the process. What are the expectations, particularly from those associated with the movement for church reform? Genevieve, I think the first expectations are about the process itself. And uh, firstly, we want one voice, one value. We want uh, lay people and all other members of the Plenary Council to walk together and journey together in co-responsibility, known as synodality in the church's uh, current language. Uh, secondly, we want open communication between uh, the Catholic community and the Plenary Council. Uh, a two-way communication. This has been a long process, uh, which has involved um, consultation and submissions, 17,500 of them from uh, across the Catholic community. And we want those communications and consultations to be respected within the um, Plenary Council. I think they've been forgotten <laughs> in drawing up the uh, agenda questions for the Plenary Council, and we want them uh, for, right front and center, if you like, uh, as far as uh, discussions are concerned. So, uh, and we, we also want embedded in the uh, Plenary Council, um, equal relationships between uh, uh, the hierarchy and, and lay uh, Catholics. We're underrepresented in the uh, Council, but we want our voice to be heard loud and clear. Now you've written in your own blog about your hopes for good process and good outcomes. How much is genuinely open for discussion? Yeah, when it would appear that the council agenda steers clear of apparently contentious issues like women's role in the church, for example. Yes, I was very disappointed with the uh, agenda questions. I think they're very bland. And uh, I also think they um, miss out on important issues. As you said, the uh, consultation uh, showed that the high priority for Australian Catholics is 
equal role for women in decision making, equal role for the laity, but particularly equal role for women, given the male character of the Australian Catholic, Catholic Church. And I think that will have to be fought for over the, not only the next week, but over the, the years to come, leading up to uh, the second uh, assembly uh, next July. So look, I'm hopeful. You have to enter these processes being hopeful, um, but undoubtedly there's a lot of hard work to be done. Look, there was a lengthy consultation process, tens of thousands of responses. What weight will the voices of the faithful have as this process continues? I think the, the, the weight will be twofold. One, there'll be the weight of those uh, lay men and women within the plenary council itself. Um, uh, roughly speaking, probably a third of the uh, plenary council members are lay women and men. But I think... Uh, the plenary council members can't do it by themselves, which is a funny thing to say because we're inside the, the community, which is the plenary council, but uh, it's the whole Catholic community, I think, um, through its prayers, certainly, but also through raising its voice over the next week and, and beyond to make sure that those issues which they raise are ones that continue to be brought before uh, the plenary council members. Now, that's not always as easy as it sounds because... Uh, the plenary council members have a sort of protective ring around them uh, to, to uh, protect the discernment process. But we all know plenary council members or we know people who know plenary council members. Let's raise our voices over the next week through publicity and through uh, direct communications, uh, as many have done already, uh, and to make those voices heard. Well, we know you and we have you, John, so as we embark <laughs> on this process. But look, John, anyone who thinks that this will affect instant change should not be holding their breath. This is bound to be a slow process. Talk to me about what other barriers the process of change needs to surmount. Sure. Perhaps uh, beginning with the process itself, I think. Um, uh, recently, I've heard several people compare the Plenary Council to the Camino, uh, and they're trying to make the point that this is a long, slow process, that people, uh, when they walk the Camino, uh, don't expect to get to the other end immediately. Now, that can be seen as, uh, you know, just uh, tapping us on the head and saying that change uh, can't happen immediately. But uh, I think there is a, at least a grain of truth in it. Um, one of the barriers, I think, is that um, we in the church in Australia live in silos called dioceses and those dioceses have tremendous authority and power to implement change and uh, so it's not just the decisions of the plenary council it's the it's the implementation of those decisions um, a second point of course and there's much discussion about this is that um, we're part of a, a universal church or an international church and uh, some of the things which we might want discussed will have to be referred to the Vatican, um, fortunately or unfortunately. I think, um, for instance, uh, questions to do with ord ordained ministry uh, will undoubtedly be ones that have to go to Vatican because canon law uh, prescribes those issues. But I would say, at the very least, um, the voice of the Australian Catholic community has to be heard. And, and those in authority in the Australian church, that is the bishops, have to make sure that that voice is conveyed loudly, uh, reasonably and rationally, but also loudly to ultimate decision makers in Rome. Well, I guess that's a question in itself, John. We could have this large and fruitful discussion, but can we expect that the outcomes from the plenary council as a whole will be faithfully reflected to the powers that be in role? I mean, that, that's incumbent on the bishops to take those findings and to reflect them in their entirety, is it not? I, I, th I think the, uh, the voices of the plenary council have to be reflected in their entirety, certainly. And there are formal channels, but we all know in this world there are informal channels too. And there's an international uh, reform movement. And I would expect that the international reform movement, who are looking at what happens in the plenary council in Australia, because synods are going on in various forms around the world, that they too will be taking any uh, uh, recommendations, any decisions, any discernment uh, uh, by the plenary council members 
uh, to the to the world church, to the international church, and to decision makers uh, in Rome, certainly. But I would say that um, certainly the issues that have to be referred are important. But uh, to put a percentage on it, I would say that 90% of, of what uh, the church reform movement wants can in fact be implemented within the Australian church if, if we can convince um, uh, those in charge of parishes, those in charge of dioceses, those in charge of religious institutes uh, to take steps to, to implement things which the Pope is calling for uh, after all. Uh, and uh, it's up to us not just to listen to the plenary council, but to listen to what the Pope is saying about synodality and about co-responsibility and to put it into practice in uh, right across the Australian church, not to dilly-dally any longer, because a lot of these ideas like diocesan pastoral councils, for instance, uh, which is part of the governance reforms, they've been around for ages. And it's not a question of new ideas in some instances, uh, coming out of the plenary council. It's the iteration of old ideas. After all, it was 20 years ago that uh, one woman, one man, the, the inquiry into the place of women in the Australian church came up with many of the recommendations which still haven't been implemented. And, uh, uh, and the plenary council will be revisiting once again. Well, finally, of course, John, this is round one. There's a whole second round to come in the plenary council. And then, of course, that goes to Rome, as you say. I mean, it could be years down the track before we see any visible effects, couldn't it? I'd be extremely disappointed if we... There, there will be some visible effects, which may be a long way down the track. But I would say to the uh, uh, Catholic community, there are so many uh, uh, effects, so many outcomes, which could be implemented now. Um, and certainly they could be implemented after the second assembly of the plenary council in July. So I'm not negative or pessimistic about a range of reforms which are on the table already and which those communities, those Catholic communities that want to implement them, of course, they have to convince their pastors and their leaders, uh, but their pastors and their leaders in many cases, uh, I would hope are open to be, to be convinced and just need that push along, which uh, the uh, Catholic community and the reform movement um, uh, is ready to give, is, is, is urgently wanting to give. I mean, my view of the reform movement is that, sure, there's what, what, what I might call the inner circle of the reform movement, but there's a wider reform movement. There are many, many members of the Catholic community who haven't yet put up their hands um, directly. Uh, and I would hope that as they listen to the plenary council and as they digest the uh, ideas that are put forward, that they will take them to their place of work, their place of worship, uh, wherever they are located in the Australian Catholic community and say, look, now's the time to move forward, to uh, move towards a modern Catholic church in Australia, which has so much to offer to the broader Catholic community. John, you've always been an optimist and you're also a political scientist, which makes that a terrific combination for the discussion that we are about to have. Look, it's terrific to talk to you. And, um, and you are blogging, of course, throughout this entire council process and people will be able to read your thoughts to, uh, to have a look at your analysis of the process. That's right, uh, uh, Genevieve. Um, each time there's a, rem a reminder for these plenary trackers, uh, my blog and that and that of Francis Sullivan, my fellow uh, reform movement member and member of the plenary council, will go directly to anyone who's registered for these uh, these plenary trackers. They're available in other ways, of course, on the various websites and and so on. But uh, rest assured that that each day there'll be blogs uh, coming into your inbox uh, to give insights uh, about uh, the plenary council. Yes, indeed. So the first two of those blogs are already there for everyone who's signed up. John, thank you so much. We look forward to many more insights and ideas as this momentous process rolls through. Let's move now to our panel, which is this evening comprised of Eleanor Flynn, whose degrees are in medicine and theology and who co-founded Women's Wisdom in the Church and is the co-convener of the Australian Coalition for Catholic Church Reform, and Terry Futrell, who's a long-term Canberra resident and Catholic, active and assertive, 
as encouraged by Pope Francis. He's looking for a church that has some relevance in the lives of his grandchildren. He's a, a writer and a published author. Welcome to you both. Eleanor, if I can begin with you, please. These have been tough years for what we've always called practicing Catholics. The Royal Commission in particular was, of course, horrific for so many of us. Is the Plenary Council, in your view, truly a chance for change and perhaps even redemption? Look, I, I join with John in being positive and, and very hopeful that that will be the case. Um, the second point of the agenda, it talks about the need for recognising the issues that were caused by the plenary, by the um, royal committee, or caused by the sex abuse, and then and uh, obviously highlighted in the royal commission's findings. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the things that um, the church has dealt with is some of the psychological and some of the um, physical traumas that people have suffered. Uh, through that uh, process. I don't think they've quite dealt with the spiritual pro trauma. I don't think they've really talked about that enough. There are, I know, um, communities that deal with that and some very um, out there and really good priests who are dealing with that. But I think that's one of the issues that really does need to, to be um, highlighted more. And also, I think one of, and, and as John said, there's a lot of Catholics out there who may not be um, sort of, vocally active in reform movements. But I think that the, and I know for, for our group, the uh, trauma that came from the uh, Royal Commission's findings was the impetus that, that made us join together and to start trying to work for uh, reform and for change in the church, that, 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 that the church didn't seem to, that the hierarchy didn't seem to recognise the enormous trauma done to all Catholics uh, by all these terrible revelations. And, and that, I think there is a lot of, uh, a, there are a lot of people out there who are just hoping and hoping, hanging on by the skin of their teeth and hoping that there will be enough reform in the church and enough movement to really give them a, a feeling of wanting to stay there. Yes, I think, I think you're right about the, uh, the skin of their teeth, I often say by the fingernails. Uh, Terry, I'd like to go to you. Does the process to date bear out that optimism? Are you hopeful given the way this council has been formed and structured thus far? Well, it's, it's a hard question to answer, Genevieve. Um, in a sense, I could clearly answer no. But uh, however, my answer is still yes. Um, I say no because uh, there's been a pretty clear a lot of evidence since this process began that it has gradually been manipulated and has become quite deceitful in many ways. That's sad to say that, but that's the, the truth, I believe. Um, what, we, what we have has had is a series of documents that have not illuminated the issues that have been brought forward, in, particularly in that first lot of submissions from the, the people. Uh, in fact, we've had the reverse. We've had a process of grinding those things down and out. And uh, that, I think, is now sort of brought to a conclusion by the, the rather anemic sort of agenda that we have before us at the Plenary Council. So that, that has been obviously deliberately done because there's been a several um, parts along the way where you scratch your head and say, how did we get to this point given where we started? Um, and there has been no logical sequence and development in the various documents and stages. Nothing that has sort of, nothing that you could track through in any uh, logical, sustaining way. Rather, we've had a whole lot of distractions. We've had uh, attempts to rehash issues, go over things, and in some cases, to kick them out of bounds. So the answer in that sense is no. However, I still believe that, um, we have to make this work. And uh, I think there, uh, there has to be a reckoning about this uh, early on in the, the, the actual formal processes of the, uh, the assembly, because I don't think this is something that uh, uh, people who uh, are in the, uh, the plenary council uh, representing the reform sort of views can simply just pass up. This is the agenda we have is not fit for purpose. And that has to be made very clear at the beginning. Strong words, Terry. Eleanor, back to you. I can see you nodding. Tell me how reform bodies like the A 
Triple C uh, have engaged in the preparation and whether it is actually your sense that those concerns are genuinely on the table throughout the council, the convocation, the response to the agenda. And how do you respond to that sort of fairly provocative stance from Terry that it's all a bit anemic? Um, I would I would agree, and ACCC are definitely agreed with that. Our, our view of the agenda when we saw it was that this was an anemic mishmash of um, things that we knew what was in were in the submissions. Many of us had made many of the submissions, and also um, we'd gone back and looked at them all. We knew what came out of the six themes, which was a, a bizarre sort of sidelining of the submissions into themes and then there were these 16 agenda items where the word women is mentioned once um, in a general comment about the laity men and women um, so yes I agree that they they were these this agenda these agenda items were were not what we thought we'd submitted what we did from a triple CR was go through them all spend a lot of time and a lot of energy from all the members um, looking and suggesting ways that the plenary council members might be able to address these agenda items going back to the sense of the faithful, what it was that the faithful had really put in their submissions, what they were really worried about, what they were concerned about, where they wanted the church to go. Um, so that was published and has um been sent to all plenary council members um, and we also um, organized some convocations of Catholics which of course in these times were Zoom meetings um, so we had one in, in uh, earlier in the year uh, one very recently and there will be a, a third one after the, the plenary. Um, the first one had Joan, Sister Joan Chittister um, uh, speaking to us using wonderful biblical imagery of the um, mountains in, in Israel, um, the, the things that we need to address to become, as she said, adults, to grow up, to challenge the church, to, to be truly faithful. Um, the second convocation um, had members of the Australian um, Catholic Church talking about their issues and and also um, an, an one international speaker talking about their issues, particularly in relation to women um, from Deborah Zanella um, issues that they're concerned about um, that they feel that the plenary council needs to address uh, Robert Fitzgerald, of course, talking about the um, the Royal Commission and its findings and with John uh, Warhurst wrapping up the those that session and all of those um, uh, speeches and all of our suggestions about what the plenary council agenda how you could use those points to actually address the issues that need to be addressed um, have been published in, in a book called um, a church for all and that has also we've also sent copies of that to all the bishops um, and uh, to any of the plenary council members who'd like one so they're, they're the things that we've been doing well, just, just on that notion of a church for all, certainly the voice of women, critically important, and we know that that's significant for the church in Australia as a whole, but the voices of Catholics who are divorced, remarried, yeah. LGBTQI+, plus anyone who is not a neat fit in the traditional hierarchy, all voices should and will be heard. Do you have confidence that that will be apparent throughout the council proceedings? Um, it remains to be seen. I live in hope. Um, and I hope that the spirit, as um, um, Mary McAleese said at the Root and Branch Seminar uh, Synod in, in Bristol the other day, sometimes the spirit gets through the cracks. Um, so we just have to pray that the spirit gets through the cracks and that these issues, which are vital to, to people in, in the church, um, get, get addressed and people begin to think, uh, in a real way about how to deal with them and as John said these things could be dealt with now quite a lot of them well it's an opportunity to quote Leonard Cohen unexpectedly there's a crack in everything and that's where the light gets in um, <laughs> Terry back, back to you is there a way to bear meaningful influence on the assemblies I mean is this an iterative process and the kinds of concerns that we're voicing can can they be brought to the assemblies or are voices from the ranks increasingly filtered out along the way um, well, I mean, they, they have been filtered out. There's no question about that. Um, I, I, I believe that there has to be a big stink made 
at the opening of this. You see, one, one of the things that uh, they've inflicted upon us in this plenary process is an archaic system of procedural operations. And just to give an example, one of the items in that says that the agenda shall be received with applause. Now, this is archaic medieval sort of stuff. And uh, it's the last thing that ought to happen given our criticisms, legitimate criticisms of this agenda. Uh, so th th I just think there needs to be a scene of some sort when this starts tomorrow, because if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it's not gonna happen at any time. And I think really, there's a lot of uh, the church internationally is looking at this process um, and a message needs to be given. It needs to be delivered clearly, but if it means upsetting some people, so be it. Uh, because we have seen what has happened to date with this wash through of uh, ideas that the rich deposit of, pe of uh, ideas and thinking that the Australian Catholic community put forward to begin with and it is basically just being washed away. Uh, so I think there has to be a, a, big, a big stink, if you like, of some sort. But I think we have to, uh, and people like John, have to work with those in the, in the plenary council who are at least disposed to being open. And I guess that will become apparent in one way or another. It's all the more difficult because it is a Zoom uh, or a, an online thing. But... Uh, I think, I think we keep being told that by uh, Archbishop Coleridge that the, this is not business as usual. Well, I think we need to deliver that message right up front. And uh, it relates to procedure and the process as much as anything else. So Terry, what, what, what's the main game then now? How do we move from process to meaningful outcomes? Given the concerns you have over, over process and agenda, how do we then move the dial along to get something real done? Well, I mean, I don't think we can expect too much over the next few days, but I would, I would think out of this week's sittings uh, or sessions that there could be, there should be some statements of intent uh, that could be made on behalf of this plenary council community. Um, and uh, they, they could uh, go to things like uh, a statement that commits the Australian Church to using the talents, all the talents in the Australian Catholic community, men and women, in, in all sorts of roles, uh, in deliberate decision making and in ministry. So that's one. A second one would be a recognition about governance. And if ever there's some, a matter that is sort of, if you like, an easy pick, there is a report that was done for the bishops at their request that provides a roadmap to this. There should be a commitment of intent coming out of this, this week to go down with that, or proceed with that. There should also, I think, be some sort of an intent and a recognition to deal with clericalism. Um, that, is, that is a major issue that the uh, Catholic bishops want to seemingly not face up to. Uh, and at there, they are at odds with the Pope. So we ought to be pressing that hard. And the other point that I'd say is that there really is an opportunity, I think, for the Plenary Council early on to make a, an, a commitment and a statement relating to working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the development of an Australian Catholic Aboriginal spirituality. Uh, there's wonderful resources that have been around for 50 years that could do, help us do that. We've squandered those opportunities. We should not waste any more moments. We must do it. Well, let's see what happens tomorrow morning. And if there is indeed a big stink, I'm not sure how you'll engineer that on Zoom, Terry. <laughs> but we'll see what I can let off a stink bomb. That's as fast as I, much as I can do. <laughs> but look, let, let's now move to your questions via our moderator. The questions have gone through the chat function. Tracy McEwen is with us. She's undertaking a PhD in theology and sociology. And her research investigates generations, women's experience and participation in Catholicism. And she's also the vice president of WATAC, Women and the Australian Church. Tracy, over to you. What do people want to know? Look, there's a lot, a lot that people want to know. And I watched the mass today and I listened to the sermon and I heard um, 
um, Lumen Gentium being quoted in detail. And one thing that struck me is one of the big things in that document is that the faithful can't err in, in matters of belief. And, you know, so it, there is, um, there are quite a few questions actually about, um, about processes, but also about um, the feeling of positivity and, and negativity. And there are some people asking in the questions, you know, why are people so despondent? And like before I throw that question over, there, there is um, also like in the balance of that, there are some questions coming through about um, what actually were the processes and what, what happened it, when, how were the delegates chosen? Um, there was some pushback against your question, your point, John, that most Catholics had one degree of separation from a delegate, you know, that um, a lot of people, particularly young and marginalised people, may not have access to a delegate. So um, I just kind of want to put those two things together um, and say, and ask you the question, is it the, um, and I might throw this to Terry and maybe to John, is it the is it the process that's making people so negative? Can I start with that? Uh, yes, go ahead. Look, I, the, the process, I suppose, is part of uh, uh, what may be making people negative. Um, I think, I don't think we, we, the church, have done a very good job of uh, um, making clear exactly what the process is. I think if there's a negativity, in the process, it's that the early enthusiasm two or three years ago, which generated hundreds of thousands of people in, in being involved and seven and a half thousand submissions, uh, seems not to have seems to have been forgotten. I think in the stages since since then. So I think that's one aspect of the negativity. I think the other aspect of the negativity, and I see it as more important, is the fact that as Catholics. <clears throat> we've been brought up to be very passive in our own hierarchical church. And I think there are many Catholics of all ages, those who are of, the, of my age, who, who feel that Vatican II hasn't been properly um, um, implemented in, in the church, and that they look around them at, at uh, the church, whether it's the parish level or the diocesan level, and they think this is a, this is a church of the status quo. That, that this is a church that just doesn't change. And uh, so I think it's both process and the culture of the church that we see around us, which hasn't produced the changes that it should have produced over the last 50 or 70 years um, of the lives of, uh, of Australian Catholics. That would be my view. Um, my, my comment on that would be, there's never been a better time to be a reformist in the Catholic church. And I say that uh, as one who's been involved in this for nearly 60 years, given that uh, it's about that time since Vatican II finished. Um, but we have, we have various uh, things aligning for us. We have uh, a Pope who, frankly, if he read the document that was put uh, together in the first lot of submissions uh, from Australian Catholics, would probably find himself agreeing with very much of it. Uh, the reality is that, that what the Australian Catholic reform groups are putting forward aligns very much with what Pope Francis has been saying or is leading us to. Um, he, he has also been invoking in a way that hadn't happened for 50 years what John was just talking about there of, of the, the teachings of Vatican II. And I must admit, I, when I watched uh, and heard the homily today and other things, I thought, this is a bit rich, really. We've got these people sort of talking about the great learnings and the teachings of Vatican II. And yet it's these same people who've done bugger all in implementing and in progressing these things for the last 40 years. So there's, there's, there's a bit of a credibility gap there. But notwithstanding that, I think that we have an alignment of the Pope and the people. And the reality is that it's the bishops that are out of the alignment. And the bishops need to realize that and get on board because 
what we told them when this process started was that we had very little credibility in them and their trust was, was shot. Well, it's going to be a lot worse if this ends up being just a talk fest. Thanks so much for those answers. I've, I've got something to put to you now, Eleanor. There's a few questions coming through about, like, can change really happen? Like, you know, um, we're, we're talking about um, female priests and deacons, and can that change really happen if we have to go back to Rome? Um, is that really a synodal process? And there was a point made that in light of the Southern Cross, John, um, Richard Lennon, you know, who was a co-author of the document said, nothing in that document regarding like governance, particularly on I make the point to do with women, um, couldn't be done immediately. And, you know, as you would know, we had um, the woman and man report back and their fantastic social justice statement in the year 2000. And, you know, we've now had a complete breakdown of, um, even though we had that process and we had the promises made, the um, recommendations in that report, um, none of them have actually been implemented. So, you know, does this really have any power? If or Is it a real synodal process if we're having to keep going back to Rome? Yeah, <clears throat> look, I would agree that it's, it's, it's a synodal in name only, I guess, if we, if everything that we do and everything that gets done in this process has to go to Rome. I would say that there is a real movement. Um, there has been a movement, as you, and you talked about the woman and man um, exercise um, the, and the exercise leading up to the that report in 2000, um, which I was part of, um, and the, the hopes um, for women across Australia that something might happen uh, in the church and then the constant dashing of those hopes um, with the um, the awfulness in, in uh, 20 years later of, of the bishops just deciding to get rid of um, all the structures that they'd set up um, to uh, enable women to have a bit more of a voice in the church uh, so that there's this, that absolute negativity. There is an enormous negativity also from women who basically run the church. If women walked away from the parishes in Australia um, and stopped doing the mundane tasks like cleaning and the flowers and making sure that the sheets are there for the church you know, when churches are open, um, that all of those things happen. But also they run... Um, so many of the committees um, and this heavily involved at all parish levels um, so that if we walked away um, the churches would be in great disarray but we won't because it's our church um, it's not their church um, there is a real push for a momentum about the women at least the women diaconate um, there's a new blog that Elizabeth Young has just started um, looking at women um, and the diaconate in, and well, people and the diaconate, but women included um, in the Australian context. Um, the Pope got a bunch of people together to look at women and the diaconate and then dissolve them. He's got another bunch of people together. Maybe uh, they'll come up with more answers. Um, there's a lot of really good research that shows that there were deacons um, and that they, there's a, there are processes for the ordination of women deacons. Um, there were deacons in the church for hundreds of years. Um, so it's, it's, it's incredibly annoying um, and uh, just cross-making at times that all this stuff is there and no, oh, no, we can't do it. It's um, so it's, it's, I think it's the hierarchy and I think it's um, the, the patriarchy um, terrified of women um, actually having a voice and doing things um, and saying things that, that might frighten them. Um, again, I just hope that the spirit who is in inherently female gets out and uh, sort of blows away some of these ideas. Great. Thanks, Elena. Like I, um, you know, there are women like leaving and walking away. And, you know, we've seen that in um, 
in Germany with the Maria yeah. 2.0 movement, you know, and women striking from the church. And, you know, we've seen, you know, the uptake of membership to WATAC and, um, you know, the podcast that the Grail and the WATAC have got yeah. in Australian Women Preach that's raising women's voices. What I want to put to you now, Terry, is somebody's asked, you know, what is, what is this, what does this statement look like? What does our statement of disappointment look like? look like and how do we make it up front how you know somebody said do we um you know is there some way you know when there's a call for applause to stand up and turn our backs you know is there is there some way that we can make this statement of um disappointment up front and out there um well i, I find it hard to answer that question because i'm not in the plenary council but uh, john john might have a, a view i don't know but um is there a will within the delegates john to do to do that or are, are people still in like very much engaged in the process i can't speak for every member of the plenary council of course i think most members are probably uh, engaged in the sense of being willing to speak boldly whether it's uh, boldly in plenary sessions like we're having tomorrow morning or boldly in the, uh, in the, in the 10 small groups. Um, symbolic action, uh, like the, the uh, questioner mentioned, uh, turning one's back, I'm not sure that has quite the impact on, on uh, Zoom that it does uh, <laughs> in a face-to-face in a, uh, -face setting. Um, ultimately, it's, it's up to each of the, the members of the plenary council, about 280 of us, uh, to approach their engagement, I think, or their um, coping, dealing uh, with uh, the events of the next week in their own way. Um, that's really where I would where I would leave it. Um, I, I think there is a richness in the among the plenary council membership. Um, it's easy, I think, in the or it's common in the even in the reform movement to talk of the bishops and the laity, there are of course an enormously rich number of religious women and men, and there are a range of uh, members from other parts of parts of the church. So I don't think we should be binary in our view of who's actually in the in the tent. Um, there are people coming from all sorts of directions, um, and I think they'll engage in different ways. Yeah. What what um what I've seen is a great willingness to listen and discern like across the spectrum of like cons what you, you might call progressive and conservative people. You know, there, there does seem to be, you know, from my perspective, a lot of engagement, particularly with the women that I've been speaking to. And this kind of brings me to the next question that um, somebody's asked. And they've asked about if there's, fa if, if it is your view, and I, I guess I'm putting this to you, John, as the political scientist, in, in your view, are there factions? And is there any um, evidence of a process of manipulation by those factions? I think what I'd say is that it would be naive to think that there are not networks of members within the plenary council and within the Australian church. I think the Australian church is kidding itself if it thinks that there are no factions, there's no networks, there's no lobbying. I think uh, whether it's bishops or lay women and men or everyone uh, in between, um, yes, there's, I'm sure. <laughs> in fact, um, the process encourages groups of members to get together and to discuss their uh, their interests. Uh, we might call it lobbying in the political uh, uh, arena. Um, but what I think it is more than that, it is just getting to know one another and finding one's common interests and applying those common interests and our, our uh, intellect and our prayer and our whatever else we bring to the engagement uh, with an open mind. You said, Tracy, that uh, among the members you knew, you thought there was a, a willingness to engage on all sides. Um, yep. and, th and that's my experience too. Um, Great. Th thanks so much for that, John. I'm sorry to cut you, you short there, but we are running out of time. And I do apologise for all those people that haven't had a chance to get their questions in, but we'll be back tomorrow night. And I'll just pass over to Genevieve. 
Thanks so much, Tracy. I think I would uh, characterise our guests tonight as a lot of optimistic stink bomb throwers. So we, we look forward to seeing what happens as the plenary council proceedings begin tomorrow morning. Look, just a reminder, if you're joining us throughout the week, put your questions into the chat function and Tracy will be moderating that every night. Thanks to our guests, John Warhurst and our panellists, Eleanor Flynn and Terry Futrell. And please do join us again tomorrow night for more breaking news from the Plenary Council and a discussion on the theme of spirituality and the earth, applying the themes of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, to the Australian experience and to the richness of our First Nations dreaming. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow night.